So good afternoon again. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the latest IIEA webinar. Uh, my name is Frances Rouen and I'm a member of the Institute and it's my honour to chair the session today. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Sharon Donnery, who's the Deputy Director of the Central Bank and who's been given very generously of our time this afternoon to uh, come and talk to us again. She's done this before at the IIEA and it's very good to welcome her back. Her talk is going to be entitled Risks, Resilience and Policy Response to COVID-19. So she'll speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll go to a Q&A uh, with, with the audience. You'll be able to join the Q&A discussion uh, by using the Q&A button on the machine to take questions. We will collect those during the talk, and then we'll have them answered as many as possible by Deputy Governor at the end. Um, a reminder for you today is that the presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. So on the record as opposed to under Chatham House rule. So please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So let me formally introduce um, Deputy, Deputy um, Governor Donnery and then hand over to her. So Sharon was appointed Deputy Governor of the Central Bank in March 2016. She's an ex officio member of the Central Bank Committee and, the governors, and is the Governor's alter, alternate at the Governing Council of the ECB. Her, in, within the central bank, she's responsible for leading the financial stability, economics and statistics and financial operations directors, directors of the bank. She's also the chair of the ECB budget committee, having been appointed by the ECB governing council in December 2016. So Sharon, great pleasure to hand over to you. Uh, so thanks a million, uh, Francis, and good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely uh, to be back at the Institute again. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. It's also really lovely to see you, Francis, if only virtually. Uh, as people on the call, I'm sure know, you were one of the first female economists at the Central Bank. Uh, and I think your career research, particularly on the Irish economy and the policies needed for us to prosper in this increasingly globalised world, will no doubt offer some really interesting so insights today to what, of course, are unique times. As Francis said, I'm going to speak today about the macro financial environment in Ireland amid COVID-19. So I'll address the risks to Irish financial stability, both domestic and international, the resilience of our economy and the financial system, and some of the recent policy responses that we've taken at the Central Bank of Ireland, uh, along with our colleagues in Europe. So I think the key message is that while we've built up resilience in the financial system over the last decade, we've only seen the initial effects of the pandemic so far, and there remains significant uncertainty about the path of the virus, the duration of the shock that we're experiencing and the economic implications. So ensuring our policy responses really support a sustainable contribution from the financial system so that it can absorb and not amplify the shock of COVID-19 will remain to the forefront of our minds at the central bank. So I do have some slides also to use today. Um, I'm going to share those now and they'll be available on the central bank website later on, uh, along with my remarks if anybody wants to have a look at them. So if we turn to the, the second slide, I suppose I'll start by saying uh, what many of us know already, that COVID-19 is fundamentally different in nature and scope to previous economic shocks, certainly in my living memory. First, it's truly global. So unlike the 2008-2009 financial crisis, when some emerging markets acted as a form of engine for growth, today the pandemic is affecting all four corners of the world. And the World Bank reports that that it's in the deepest trough since World War II, and it's also the most synchronized since records exist. The OECD in the last few days has warned of the worst peacetime recession in a century, and their latest numbers in a single wave scenario estimate global economic activity to fall by 6% this year. In contrast, at the peak of the financial crisis, global growth fell by 1.7%. And at the end of May, over 100 countries had requested emergency financing from the IMF, which is an unprecedented number. So on the next slide, we'll see that also the size and speed of the shock is also unprecedented. So in February, for example, less than one in 20 people in the Irish labour force were unemployed. But by May, over one in four were out of work when we take into account those receiving the pandemic unemployment benefit. Thirdly, the speed of the effects itself on the economy present a real challenge to policymakers, given that key official indicators generally come with a lag. So a business cycle indicator for the Irish economy developed by some of my colleagues at the central bank offer a more timely assessment. And you can see in the chart that this indicator fell to an unprecedented low in April, 
and it was almost twice as low as the trough of the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. So the severity and the steepness of this drop suggest that the initial economic effects of the pandemic are worse than the last crisis. And of course, it remains to be seen how these effects persist as the economy is slowly reopening and businesses, workers and policymakers learn to live with COVID-19 over the medium term. Now, I spoke here at the IAEA last year also, and at that time, I pointed to the uncertain path ahead for the Irish economy. There were clouds on the external horizon, and that contrasted with then the potential for domestic overheating. Today, uncertainty stems from the path of the virus, the ability of the global public health efforts to suppress and to manage it, and how these efforts are intrinsically linked to the level of economic activity. Looking at a range of forward-looking measures, there's been an enormous increase in economic uncertainty, greater even than we saw during the financial crisis. And in this uncertain environment, swift, decisive and credible policy action can provide some certainty. So you'll see on this slide uh, some of the risks and uh, that there has been an abrupt and severe deterioration in the macro financial outlook in Ireland. A collapse in global economic activity also has the potential to trigger long identified risks to financial stability. So if we turn to the next slide, you'll see that this collapse in activity, one of the ways through which it poses risks to financial stability is through possible defaults. And the duration of the shock will largely dictate whether short-term liquidity issues ultimately in turn become solvency issues for households, businesses, and by implication, parts of the financial sector. In addition, for example, our recent uh, property survey along with the SCSI reports a median expectation for falls in property price valuations, while the ECB's bank lending survey also reports expectations of reduced demand for some forms of credit. Now, also in terms of financial markets, the shock has led to a repricing of risk premium with large falls in risky asset prices and tighter financing conditions globally. And recent research, which you can see referenced on the right here, shows that Ireland is particularly sensitive to tightening in global financial conditions. And this, of course, has implications for domestic lending, asset prices and economic output. Now, on the next slide, you can see that, of course, in response to the shock, governments around the world have significantly and I think importantly, necessarily increased spending to support their economies. This, as I said, has been necessary both to support affected households and businesses, but also to minimise the long term damage of this shock to the economy. However, it does bring risk over the medium term with higher public debt levels. Heightened public debt issuance, for example, could put pressure on government bond yields in some euro area countries. And while sovereign yields remain low in Europe, this is, of course, against the backdrop of an incomplete financial architecture. Turning to the next slide, we can see that the macro financial risks of possible defaults, these rising risk premia, these tightening financial conditions and increased debt burdens are coupled with structural vulnerabilities that we are also exposed to in Ireland being a small open economy. And I've spoken previously about the issue that you can see here in this slide about how our macro indicators tend to have higher highs and lower lows than other countries. Our open economy is much more sensitive to global developments and the smooth functioning of global value chains, the health of the US economy, the presence of multinationals in Ireland are all factors that affect our output and our household incomes. And of course, this comes at a time when other risks have not disappeared. The ongoing uncertainty surrounding the Brexit negotiations, for example, is a serious concern. And we'll focus on this uh, in our next quarterly bulletin, which is due to be published in July. Other longer term risks like the financial stability risks arising from climate change and deglobalization have also not gone away. And crystallization of these risks would further test the resilience of the economy and also the wider financial system. So let me turn now on the next slide to that resilience of both the economy and the financial system. I think a really important positive is that the starting resilience of households and businesses and indeed the domestic banking system is significantly stronger compared to when we went into the onset of the 08-09 financial crisis. Since then, of course, the Irish banks have been deleveraging substantially and in recent years, the government has been reducing external net debt liabilities. So on the eve of the COVID-19 crisis, Ireland's overall external balance sheet vulnerabilities were relatively limited. However, on the other hand, the scale of the shock is unprecedented and I think we have only seen the initial effects. The full implications for households, businesses and the financial sector 
will only emerge over the coming months and years. Now, in the next slide, uh, we can start looking at some of the effects on businesses. So, for example, cash flow or liquidity is one of the main concerns for businesses, with about half of large corporations holding less than 8% of their annual turnover in cash, and half of SMEs holding less cash, and also SMEs having less access to undrawn credit than their larger counterparts. So while the government has stepped in to provide support in the form of wage subsidies and the deferral of tax liabilities, for example, and the banking system has provided liquidity via payment breaks and lending, the risk remains of liquidity issues turning into solvency issues for some firms. And as with all facets of the crisis, the extent of this will depend on both the path and the duration of the virus. So the severity and scarring are likely to differ across sectors and regions. And so I think careful analysis and subsequently targeted policy will be really critical. Households are also in a much better financial position than on the eve of the global financial crisis with lower debt burdens. They have a higher ability to service that debt and are more resilient to falls in house prices. Payment breaks have, of course, provided some breathing space for those who are hard hit. And it's a key way in which the banking system has been easing liquidity strains on the household sector. However, of course, some borrowers may continue to experience difficulties when their payment breaks expire. And in such cases, the bank has been clear that it expects lenders to ensure appropriate solutions, including forbearance, are available. Now, my written remarks, I expand a little further on our thinking um, on payment breaks, which I won't dwell on here. Uh, suffice to say, I think that we are carefully supervising this process to ensure that our expectations are being met. The resilience of borrowers, though, of course, is intertwined with that of lenders and banking crises cast the longest shadow, especially those that have been fueled by credit. So avoiding such a scenario is therefore paramount. So lenders can ease or amplify economic crisis so their resilience is central to minimising potential scarring effects. Now, if we look at the next slide, you'll see that through steps taken in recent years, the domestic banks are more resilient than they were in the past. The capital requirements that were imposed on them have ensured that they are better prepared for economic shocks like the one that we face now. In addition, their lending practices have been more prudent in recent years than in the run-up to the financial crisis, and they are able to rely on capital buffers to absorb losses and, of course, to continue to lend to the economy. On the next slide, though, we'll see that the banks do have significant exposures to the sectors that have been most affected by COVID-19, and, of course, their profitability has fallen in the run-up to the pandemic. So, in other words, the resilience of the banks is not unlimited. The banking system is expected to make losses, the scale of which will depend on the evolution of the virus and the scarring effects of the crisis. Now, thinking beyond domestic resilience, if you look at the next slide, you'll see some of the interconnections of the financial system in the time of this global crisis, which also have a significant bearing. The investment fund sector globally, for example, saw large redemptions in March, and the subsequent dash for cash, especially dollars, put significant pressure on other markets, markets that had previously been seen as both safe and liquid. So this tightening of global financial conditions was partly mitigated by large central bank interventions. Over time, though, I think the question to the extent to which structural vulnerabilities from liquidity mismatches and leverage in the global fund sector contributed to this market disruption will need to be addressed. So let me turn now to policy responses on the next slide, which have been both domestic and global. I think over the last three months, what you've seen is a range of fiscal, monetary, macro prudential and micro prudential policy actions. And these have really been designed to support households and businesses through the crisis so that the financial system can best absorb but not amplify the shock. Governments worldwide have introduced fiscal policy with common features being things like household income supports, business loans and guarantees. And while fiscal policy is crucial to ease the effects of the crisis, monetary policy can also ensure that the cost of borrowing remains low. But in understanding the important differences between these two policy spheres, I think Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve captured it well when he said, the Fed has lending powers, not spending powers. Central banks have conducted monetary policy to maintain liquidity in the financial system, to support the flow of credit to the real economy and to prevent a tightening in financial conditions. Central to our pursuit of price stability, the aim of our monetary policy has been to ensure the continued supply of credit to the economy through the crisis and of course to aid the recovery from the shock. 
as a member of the euro system the central bank of ireland has also been central to this response by the ecb and the euro system now as i mentioned earlier the resilience of the banking system has been enhanced over the last decade both macro and micro prudential policies have resulted in increased capital and liquidity buffers to be used precisely in a crisis like this so to echo my colleague sir john cunliffe of the bank of england while building resilience in the financial system in good times might seem expensive, it's the better economic bet over the long run. On the next slide, you'll see some of the policy responses at the bank, including, for example, the reduction of the counter-cyclical capital buffer, uh, which we reduced from 1% uh, to 0%. And this release freed up approximately 940 million euro of capital across the domestically relevant banking sector. The next slide, thanks. Sorry, you were right, yeah. The, the OC buffer can also be used to absorb losses in times of stress. And consistent with EBA guidelines, the central bank has been clear that credit institutions should not pay dividends for the financial year 2019 or 2020 until at least the 1st of October 2020, and should also refrain from share buybacks aimed at remuneration shareholders. The mortgage measures, which have built both bank and borrower resilience since their introduction in 2015, and I think it's fair to say that we're seeing the benefits of these in a period of stress like that we are experiencing today. So today, over one quarter of the stock of lending is within the scope of the measures. And people will recall that the measures have two objectives, to strengthen both bank and borrower resilience to negative economic and financial shocks, and also to prevent the re-emergence of a credit price spiral. Now, all these measures aim to reduce the risk of a credit crunch. I think it's in the interest of borrowers and lenders alike to maintain the supply of credit in a sustainable manner. Former Governor Lane, now an ECB executive board member, noted last week that the ECB is determined to make sure that the crisis is not made worse by an avoidable credit crunch. So to conclude on the last slide, I think reflecting these words and actions of central banks and regulators all around the world, in the Central Bank of Ireland, we're working to ensure the financial system can best absorb and not amplify the fallout from the pandemic. As the initial effects of this exceptional shock have materialised, the banking and financial system have withstood the initial pressures. The system, of course, has benefited significantly from the painstaking and globally coordinated efforts by policymakers and regulators to build up resilience over the last decade. On the eve of this crisis, the financial system was stronger than a decade ago, but its resilience is not limitless and its continued stability is heavily supported by policymakers worldwide. I think the full effects of the crisis will emerge over time as the damage and scarring to sectors is realised and the extent of that depends on the path, the persistence and waves of the virus and the necessary public health responses. Many thanks again to the IIEA for the invitation and for your attention and I look forward uh, to the questions now. Karen, thank you very much indeed for that very lucid presentation. Uh, and I just want to encourage everybody to start in their questions for the Q&A. But let me begin by one which, um, I suppose looking back, you were around for the 2008, 10, 11, 12 crisis. Um, how well do you think that the, the institutions are operating on this occasion relative to the other the previous occasion in terms of the sense you have being watching what's actually happening on the ground within the EU, but even within Ireland? And you make a point under your discussion of resilience that we need to be, you know, have more targeted policy. And I suppose my link on question to that is, are we getting better at targeting? Have we actually got enough uh, information and analysis done now to allow us to do the kind of targeting that we'd wish to do to be effective? Uh, thanks, Francis. So I think, uh, I mean, first, it's important, I think, to emphasise a couple of the points I made there in the remarks. It's very, very different this time. So the financial system was actually at the centre of the causes of the crisis the last time, uh, whereas this obviously is coming from a, a public health uh, dimension and starting with the real economy and feeding into the financial system. So I think that's an important difference. Um, its nature, though, I think across the entire financial system is also quite different. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure people are, are watching some of our commentary and analysis over the last few weeks and months, but, you know, there are issues to do with the insurance sector, there are issues to do with the banking sector, credit unions, etc., Whereas the, the previous crisis, certainly in Ireland, was very much focused um, on the domestic banks. I think much has changed since the previous crisis in terms of our framework and, you know, the powers that we have at the central bank, the ability that we've had over the last number of years to look at some of those things like building up resilience, our approach, but also the approach globally to supervision, 
uh, the amount of data and analysis that we have in central banks now and regulators to kind of understand what's going on. So I think it's a very different environment. Um, on your point about targeted policy, I mean, I think it's, it's always the case for public policymakers that we should be aiming to make sure that our policies are targeted and effective. I think particularly so when we have a, a shock on the scale and, and breadth uh, that we have at the moment. Again, I certainly think uh, that many of us, uh, not just the central bank, but it kind of in the wider public service in the Department of Finance in Ireland and also internationally, you know, there's a lot better data. There's, I think, a better understanding um, of some of the issues, the interconnected nature of Ireland globally, for example. And in Europe, I think we've also seen some benefits in terms of the way the ECB has been able to act uh, quite swiftly. Uh, but of course, as I mentioned there in my remarks, um, at European level, you know, the architecture is not fully complete. We've made some progress on banking union, for example, but it's not uh, concluded. Uh, there are still a lot of debates about progress on capital, market, capital markets union and so on. And um, so while there has been progress, I think there is more work to do, uh, not just about the pandemic, but about that sort of architecture of the European institutions and so on. I think maybe the last thing I would say is about this policy coordination. So I, I suppose sometimes in the past you would see maybe an absence of policy coordination, but I think in fairness, globally, uh, at European level and even domestically, you know, there have been a significant fiscal response, a significant uh, monetary policy response, macro and micro prudential. And I think they have been designed in a way to be uh, mutually reinforcing and complementary. Um, and I think the ECB has been very clear since this emerged that at a European level, that kind of coordinated fiscal response is, is very much necessary. Rick Kinsella from DCU has asked the following question. Would it make sense for the NTMA to issue very long government bonds in the current context? Uh, well, I mean, I think the first thing I have to say is, uh, you know, the NTMA in general does a really good job of managing uh, the, the debt. Uh, we work uh, quite closely with them, obviously, um, in the bank in a number of uh, different guises, including, for example, on the Financial Stability Group, which is the kind of state architecture uh, for looking at some of these issues. Um, I think it's clear that we have a very low interest rate environment at the moment, which I think is an important backdrop for the kind of size of the fiscal response that's going to be necessary and for the debt issuance that's going to be required. Um, and I think we've been saying in the bank, um, I mean, for some time, but also particularly recently, that we do have to have a regard to the more medium term and longer term sustainability of that debt. And um, so I do think there are benefits, of course, to issuing debt uh, longer term at low interest rates. Um, and I think, uh, you know, all of those issues, I'm sure, are on the mind of the NTMA and thinking about how they manage um, our debt over the coming months and years. OK, so let me say, say, say um, uh, there's another question in. And could I just say when people are sending in questions, I should have said so at the beginning, just give your name and institution as well as the question, please. So Mary Farrell from ECPR has asked the question, what is the most appropriate balance between fiscal and monetary policy to counter the effects of the pandemic? Yeah, so I think we've been clear about this and the ECB have been clear as well that, you know, um, monetary policy can't be, to use that famous quote, the only game in town. Um, and the reliance cannot be on kind of monetary policy to be a, the, the first order of effect. The type of supports that are required, you know, some of which I described there um, in my remarks uh, in terms of providing uh, support to those who are maybe unemployed or the wage subsidy schemes, the supports that SMEs need um, in terms of, you know, the potential for grants, waivers of tax liabilities and so on, um, are clearly those uh, that fit very much in the realm of, of fiscal policy. Um, and we have been clear, I think, that that has been a, a, a very necessary response. Um, I mentioned what um, Jay Powell, the chairman of the Fed, said there in recent days, uh, in terms of you know, central banks having lending powers, not spending powers, I think it's a really good way of thinking about it. So of course we can provide uh, supports to the economy, uh, we can uh, provide liquidity through the banks, um, we can uh, make interventions like quantitative easing and so on, which obviously affects interest rates. But the kind of direct transfers uh, that have been needed uh, through fiscal policy, like uh, the pandemic unemployment benefit, uh, the supports that are being provided to SMEs and so on obviously have to come uh, through the fiscal system. Uh, so I think there are kind of differences uh, in terms of the types of support uh, that need to be provided. Um, and this is certainly a case, I think, where that fiscal support uh, has been uh, necessary. Back to your own question earlier on, though, Francis, uh, I think we've also been clear that it needs to be targeted and effective. Uh, clearly, we're incurring you know, very significant levels of public expenditure and so on. And we need to make sure uh, that they go on the right thing and they provide the right sort of uh, supports and so on uh, to, to the right sectors or to the, the 
right people or businesses or companies that need that support. Uh, another question is in from Alan Jukes, former Minister for Finance, uh, and the question is as follows. Can Sharon say how much ECB originating liquidity has flowed through the Irish banks to businesses and at what interest rates? Yeah, so I think um, the ECB and ourselves, I mean, we implement that policy here, you know, the, the lending that's decided on by the governing council so that the ECB can lend on um, to the banks is, is obviously operationalised by the Central Bank of Ireland um, here locally. Um, we have a number of standing facilities that predated uh, the pandemic, of course, uh, that were always in place. Um, and as part of the kind of unconventional monetary policy that we've had over the last number of years, uh, we've had so-called targeted long-term refinancing operations where banks can borrow over a slightly longer time period um, and at lower interest rates if they meet certain uh, benchmarks or certain levels of lending on into the real economy. And then that's been supplemented by a dedicated facility uh, for the pandemic, um, which has sort of more favourable terms and conditions from the point of view of the lending to the banks. The Irish banks, I suppose, are slightly different maybe than some other banks um, in Europe. And this goes to the kind of some of the changes that have been made uh, since the financial crisis. Um, one of the issues in the financial crisis was, of course, that they were heavily exposed uh, to funding internationally. That would have been kind of flighty funding that would leave the banks uh, when they came under strain. And, and they've changed, I suppose, their approach to their own funding. And they're therefore a lot less dependent um, on liquidity uh, from the central bank. So while we have a number of operations kind of available for the domestic Irish banks, uh, there wouldn't be a significant take up of those facilities because they have their own funding sources either directly from the market or through their deposit base. Um, so it, we are maybe slightly different in that respect uh, than some other countries, but those facilities are obviously always there. Um, the targeted long-term refinancing operation, the terms and conditions have quite recently been uh, changed and the pandemic, um, refinancing operation is quite new so I suppose it remains to be seen whether this further take up of those over the coming months by the Irish banks. Okay so a, a question in now from a former boss of yours Patrick Conan is a former central bank governor who's now at Trinity and the Peterson Institute. Could Sharon tell us a bit about the operations of the central bank and the ECB during the shutdown? To what extent is it easier does it turn out to be easier hard to do things remotely? I guess as organisations that are very big buildings and centres of, of, of major centres, have you any, any perspective you'd like to share with us on that? Um, well, Governor Hona himself was quite instrumental in kind of enhancing our ways of working at the bank, as he knows. Um, a very big part of the practicalities of our move to North Wall Quay was a significant enhancement of our technology, actually. Um, and I have to give full compliments to our kind of operations team, our IT staff and so on, um, which has meant that the bank is essentially fully functioning. Um, mostly remotely. We have a small number of, of critical staff in really critical functions and so on that are still in the building. Um, we obviously have to um, distribute cash and so on, for example. And I have to say that has been the case across uh, the Eurosystem, uh, also the case of the ECB. And I think it, it highlights the importance actually of operational resilience. So when we talk about financial stability in the bank, you know, we're often asked about the capital position of the banks and their resilience from a financial position which of course is critical and um, but i think it's also become clearer over recent years especially as technology becomes more prevalent in the payment system and so on that operational resilience is also uh, quite critical and that has been really tested over the last number of months not just for central central banks but for the financial system as a whole it's an area we've been looking at uh, quite carefully over the number of uh, the last number of years uh, but i would say in general it has probably proved um, easier to operate than we would have expected, especially given the length of time. I mean, we've had previous incidences like uh, storms and so on without out of the office for a few days, uh, but to be out of the office in such a sustained way is clearly very unusual. We are, of course, though, also um, talking quite a lot to firms about their own plans, their business continuity plans, their operational resilience as well, uh, whether that's how they interact with customers, but also their kind of ability to interact interact in financial markets uh, and so on and we're very conscious I think of cyber security risks and so on and thinking about some of those issues which I think people on the call would probably be aware have increased significantly there are, you know there have been quite a number of um, you know a big increase in the number of cyber attacks frauds scams things like that so I think we do also have to be alert to those. So Sharon, can I come back in with a question while waiting for my colleagues online to send in some more because I have a lot of issues raised but I was just wondering whether the experience of the global financial crisis has put banks, and I guess related institutions, banks in particular, 
in a better place for dealing with businesses and house, households this time around. There was a lot of criticism at the time about their ability to, to actually manage, if you like, their client base. Do you have a sense that that's, in a sense, you've got experience of, of having been through one crisis, so a lot of the people on the ground have actually been there before in a different shape and not as intense as previously, but what do you think this time? Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, one of the critical challenges at the beginning of the global financial crisis, let me start with Ireland first, maybe, was the inability of the banks to actually cope with the emergence of uh, arrears and non-performing loans from an operational perspective, never mind from any other perspective in terms of the kind of financial consequences and provisions and the effect on capital and so on. And we saw that very much um, in the bank's um, and, you know, during the programme, for example, the Troika programme um, and some of the supervisory work we would have had to do in the early days following the emergence of the crisis. I mean, it required, I think, a level of intensity and engagement with banks that was quite surprising just because of their poor operational capabilities. Um, I, I was asked to chair a European group subsequent to that uh, that looked at non-performing loans all across the euro area. That group had been set up by the ECB following the introduction of, of banking union and the sort of collective approach to banking supervision now in the eurozone. And I was actually really struck at the time that this operational issue was, was quite prevalent, actually. There were a number of countries uh, that had similar experiences. And one of the things that we did at the ECB was set out kind of practices guidance or expectations for firms about how they would deal with these issues and um, if they were to ever emerge again in the future and I, I would have to acknowledge I think that uh, the banks have um, you know significantly enhanced their operational approach and uh, we have also in recent days um, and I, I mentioned it briefly in the remarks there um, I mean we've engaged very heavily with the banks about the implementation of payment breaks uh, in general but in recent days we have also set out um, in a dear CEO letter um, a lot more detail on our expectations about how they will kind of implement these, uh, the need to treat their customers fairly, uh, to engage with them effectively. And I think one of the things that's on our mind is to avoid also something happened the last time, uh, which, you know, we used to refer to as extend and pretend, uh, where people entered into repeated short term arrangements. So I think if customers are going to have a longer term issue, um, and a longer term inability to pay uh, because of their employment situation or whatever. Uh, it's incumbent on the banks to make sure that engagement happens with them early and that they get the correct kind of sustainable restructuring as quickly as possible. Could I give you a question from Peter McLean, who's an IEA board member, and the question is as follows. To what extent does the prospect of the second wave of the pandemic affect economic forecasts and prospects next year and beyond that? And is there a limit to our borrowing capacity that might come into play at that time? Yeah, so it's, it's very difficult to answer. And I, I've, I've found the last few days as we've published the financial stability report and some of our analysis a big challenge on this point about uncertainty. I mean, I think it's just, uh, uh, I think the IMF said this morning, uh, Geetik opened up a profound level of uncertainty. All of these things about the risk of a second wave, and um, if there were a second wave, uh, would the response to containment measures, for example, be the same or would they be done in a different way? Many countries are talking about, for example, much more localised containment measures. So in this environment, it's very, very difficult to forecast what might happen. Uh, in fact, for us at the central bank, you know, we're really looking, I think, more at scenario type analysis like many other central banks around the world. So kind of what if it went this way and what if it, it went that way? Um, a critical factor, I think, is the, the sectoral differences. So I think it's clear already uh, that there are very different sectoral effects and um, you can see in some of the data that's coming out from the bank from CSO we published some analysis yesterday on sectors that are very directly affected sectors that are very indirectly affected and some other sectors maybe that are less affected at all so I think thinking about the economy and the effects of the virus in a sectoral way is, is quite important I mean on debt sustainability and um, as I said uh, in my remarks I mean, in general, the economy is going into this in a better place than it would have been um, a number of years ago. We do obviously, though, have a, a high uh, debt level. Um, and I think, as I said, over the medium term, we have to really think about uh, debt sustainability. But I think for now, in the context of the kind of low interest rate environment, and also the fact that the fiscal response is clearly very necessary uh, to support the economy, uh, we have to kind of proceed on that basis. In your, um, I'll go on to the next question, but I'll just put in one myself. In, the, in, um, in your paper, you make a reference to the incomplete financial architecture 
in the European context. Do you think that this, this um, pandemic is going to actually increase the speed at which some of those um, projects which you like are there and are sort of ongoing will actually will it accelerate it or will it distract attention from that because people are dealing with the current crisis as opposed to if you like completing the institutional structures that are being planned? Yeah, so I think what happened the last time certainly was there was a recognition of these uh, incompleteness issues and in fact even though there was a lot going on in many cases there was a very swift response. Uh, so the move for example to banking union and single banking supervision which you know had been mooted from time to time but never really gained um, any momentum at all and which there would have been I suppose quite a number of concerns and objections to in some countries proceeded uh, both quickly and I think given the scale of the operation that was needed to do that uh, quite effectively. So I do think um, while as you say there is an awful lot going on at the moment and you know the EU for example has many issues to deal with including the recovery fund and thinking about climate change and so on I, I do think crises like this do uh, provide the opportunity to kind of prompt thinking about what else needs to be done um, and what needs to kind of be addressed. I only touched on it briefly in my remarks there, but I think one thing we would feel quite strongly about here is uh, the kind of global non-bank sector. So Ireland, as people on the call know, has a big international financial centre. Part of that is a big funds industry. We have seen stresses and strains in the fund industry over recent weeks and months. We have said previously at the bank that you know the fund sector has been untested in times of stress and while there are certain supervisory tools when we look at funds on an individual basis uh, the way we have the kind of macro framework for banks like the macro prudential tools and um, we don't have those type of tools for funds so i think there are issues like that that, that maybe uh, would need to be addressed that hopefully there would be an opportunity uh, presented by this Banking union also, there has been significant progress, but it remains incomplete in terms of the deposit guarantee scheme, for example, at European level. Uh, and again, we have advocated for that. Uh, so I suppose I would hope that, the, that there will be opportunities uh, to use this crisis to prompt some further progress in the same way that the global financial crisis, I think, prompted some fairly significant global reforms, but particularly at European level as well. Actually, Peter McGuigan, BP, BPFI, his question was very much in the same space, but he takes it to a slightly different place. If the pandemic lasts and we see not rising non-performing loans, do you think that the regulatory framework will need immediate tweaks, um, and specifically around the treatment of non-performing loans from a regulatory capital perspective? So in other words, I suppose there's the architecture direction, but then there's, there's the changes, but then it's how you operationalize it in the meantime. Yeah, so I think we spent a lot of time after, uh, you know, once the global financial crisis had emerged, thinking about the regulatory architecture um, and thinking about how, for example, issues about timely recognition of, of non-performing loans should happen. Um, and there were certainly issues and concerns about that um, in the previous crisis. I think regulators, central banks, we should always be open to thinking about whether the frameworks need uh, reform and, and so on. But I think you can't necessarily just look at what's going on at the moment. So this crisis prevents, presents, you know, very specific aspects and so on. And we, I, I don't think it's a good idea for policymaking to just be responding to every single um, crisis or issue that emerges. We have to have a kind of coherent policy framework where we're clear about what we're thinking, we're clear about our objectives. So I think if there are, you know, amendments needed, and I mean, there is work being done, I think, in the European Parliament, looking at the Capital Requirements Directive, for example, uh, that that will happen. Uh, but of course, the framework itself needs a kind of certain coherence, and it needs to be resilient to different circumstances and different things uh, that can emerge. Uh, this is a particular type of crisis. We've seen other types of crisis in the past. We may see other types uh, of stresses and strain in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, regulatory frameworks, policy toolkits and so on have to be, I think, resilient to those different aspects. They can't just be uh, tweaked for the individual circumstances that might arise. Okay, um, I'm waiting for more questions to come in, but I have one more to keep us, keep us, keep, keep referring back to one of the things you touched on, which I guess was Brexit as one of the issues that's still out there. And I'm just wondering whether or not you think that, that in every case, the COVID factors and the Brexit factors will kind of reinforce each other. I mean, you noted the fact that there's quite a lot of sectoral differences in relation to, the, to, the, the, to COVID. And I guess they're also in related to Brexit, there are different sectoral ones. From the analysis, if any has been done in the bank, has anything emerged in terms of the extent to which they reinforce each other or they're, they're affecting different sectors? It's a more widespread rather than a, a reinforced effect. Yes, yeah, so we are looking at this also in the context of our quarterly bulletin, which we'll publish in a, a couple of weeks. 
I mean, obviously the scale, the size, the scope of the pandemic and how it's uh, affecting not only our economy, but globally is, is on a scale far more significant uh, than the effects of Brexit and also leads to this kind of profound level of uncertainty that we've been discussing. When we looked at um, Brexit in terms of sectoral effects, I mean, uh, obvious to people, I think some of the sectors around food, for example, food exports to the UK, uh, the links between Ireland and the UK around tourism, for example, and the common travel area. So maybe tourism and hospitality would be one area where there are some overlaps. Um, but obviously the hospitality sector, I think, has very um, serious challenges at the moment in any event uh, from the pandemic. So we are looking at that. I think some overlaps, uh, but also uh, some uh, differences. Um, I think for us, the uncertainty at the moment uh, because of the Brexit talks is obviously a key uh, factor. And then uh, the vulnerability, I suppose, of the Irish economy because of our close links uh, with the UK in particular uh, will be things that we're looking at in the context of the bulletin. And do you have any sense in which, you know, you, you get, you, one gets a sort of reading, reading various, various uh, papers, a sense that there's a lot of, of, I won't say harmony, but in terms of the actions that institutions and countries are taking in relation to this crisis, because as you said, it, it, it's, a, it's a truly global crisis, whereas the financial crisis called the global financial crisis wasn't quite as global as, as this has turned out to be. Do you think that will last? Do you think we're at the honeymoon stage of those interactions where we're in sense also at the same side? And how, have you any sense of how that might play out or have you had any work done that might show if you like, where countries' diff interests might bring them to different directions in relation to their responses about the extent to which there's a stimulus, a stimulus is of different kinds. Yeah, so there has certainly been some commonalities, I think. And I mean, at the central bank, I think we are uh, involved in kind of stock taking exercises around Europe and around the globe about what different policymakers have, have done, whether that's fiscal or central banks or as I said, macro or micro uh, prudential policy. And there has been, I think, using some of the the global fora, like the Financial Stability Board, for example, there have been some discussions about, you know, coordination and, and uh, as I said, trying to have mutually reinforcing uh, policies. But there have also been important differences. Like I think even at European level, we see, for example, that some of the lending supports have been more in the forms of guarantees. Um, moratoria, for example, maybe have been introduced on a statutory or legislative basis in some countries and not in others, including in Ireland, for example. Um, so there have been, I think, also some important differences. Part of those things are probably, you know, legacies from the previous crisis in terms of how the previous crisis has informed the thinking about what some central banks or some fiscal authorities uh, want to do. But I think given that also some of the effects around the globe are likely to be quite different depending on the structure of your economy, depending on some of these uh, sectoral effects, depending, for example, on the success of individual countries um, in dealing with the pandemic in their own local countries, you are likely to see, I think, ultimately some quite different, uh, potentially quite different responses. We have a question from Killian Rossi in the IIEA, and it's concerning purchases under the ECB's Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme, the PMPP, uh, will, will be extended uh, until the end of 2020, or until such time as the ECB judges the pandemic crisis to be over? And I guess it's a question of how, how does one decide what the that point? And do you envisage an extension of it, or is it largely a, a health policy question from the, from the banking well, I mean, I think the health response is going to be critical to deciding when is the crisis over. So, you know, can we uh, contain the virus? Um, the containment measures, for example, this debate about whether, um, you know, containment measures can operate in a more subtle way where they're localised or regional or particular sectors and so on. These are obviously all very, very critical aspects. And um, I think, though, on policy and um, the ECB, uh, many governors, members of the executive board and so on have been absolutely clear uh, that the ECB stands ready to take the necessary policy action to provide uh, the support that's needed um, at the moment. Um, we've obviously introduced the pandemic programme and extended it. It's been a critical, I think, policy tool over the last number of weeks and months because it's allowed a very kind of rapid and very clear uh, and sizable response. Uh, so I think that's been very important. As I mentioned, we do have the lending operations as well uh, to support liquidity. And I think I even mentioned in my speech uh, what another of my former bosses, uh, Philip Lane, said uh, last week um, about trying to avoid um, a credit crunch. Uh, 
um, and I think the ECB very much stands ready uh, to make sure along with us in uh, the various Euro system central banks that for example that doesn't happen and that the economy gets uh, the support uh, that's needed. I think the reason why that's so important is of course you know as a central bank we expect the banks to lend prudently and uh, we expect a proper risk management approach but the concern is that if there's a credit crunch now and, and banks kind of retrench um, and stop offering that kind of support that SMEs need and so on, then these liquidity problems ultimately become solvency problems for those firms. Those firms go out of business and ultimately the effect on the economy would be much worse uh, than if the, the support was uh, provided now. So I think that is why this kind of credit uh, support at the moment um, is so important. I think that's very striking in, in, your, in your presentation, just how a little credit availability that SMEs have in the nature of what they've been doing. And they, of course, were in expansion mode before this crisis came. So they're, they're, they're probably fully quite drawn down. There's a question from Michael Tutty, the form, former Assistant Secretary of the Department of Finance. Are you any concern about the future room for action from the ECB in the light of the German constitutional court ruling? Um, well, I think uh, Vice President Gindos was here at the IIEA uh, last week, um, and I think also, I mean, uh, individual central banks in the euro system and the ECB have been very clear, with all due respect to the court, uh, you know, the ECB is a European institution, um, accountable to the Parliament, um, and kind of overseen in a legal jurisdiction way uh, by the European Court uh, of Justice. As I've just said, um, we have been clear I think not just in recent weeks in terms of the crisis, but also over a longer period than that, uh, you know, that we stand ready to do whatever is required uh, to meet our price stability objective. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate, I think, in recent years about whether central banks had reached the end of their toolkit and, and so on. Um, and we've seen uh, significant developments in terms of unconventional monetary policy and how that's evolved. Uh, and I think there's an absolutely clear commitment uh, to take the policy action that's uh, needed so that ultimately we meet our price stability objective in the medium term. But of course, the focus of that on the, at the moment is, I suppose, meeting that objective through providing the support to the economy that's needed uh, right now. I mean, it does strike me that, that recovery out of this crisis, like the last time, but perhaps more so, is going to be very, confidence is going to be absolutely crucial. And statements like, you know, doing whatever it takes really helps in relation, in relation to that. If you think there's, there's going to be need for action to, if you like, promote that confidence, are, are other economic instruments that you can see doing to help promote that confidence so that people um, you know, who have the resources will actually go back into the market, whether they're households or businesses or whatever, will we'll, we'll take, we'll take risks. I mean, is there a role for policy in that space? Uh, so I do think there is. Um, I mean, I think even in thinking about the economy ourselves at the moment, um, and I've seen this at other commentators, including internationally, you know, a concern about whether um, what's happening at the moment ultimately changes kind of behaviour, sentiment, uh, big increases in precautionary savings, for example, maybe changes the way that people consume. Will it have effects on kind of globalisation and global value chains and, you know, how countries import and export and so on? So I think there's certainly potential for kind of long term effects. But in an environment where there is so much uncertainty, then I think policymakers can to some extent anyway, bring some certainty. And as I said in, in my remarks, um, you know, there's been policy across fiscal, monetary, macro prudential and micro prudential. Uh, so I think you know, people can take confidence that action is being taken uh, to support the economy uh, through this so that we have you know, the best chance of, of ultimately emerging from this and being on a kind of path to as quick a recovery as is possible. Uh, so I do think there is an important role for policymakers in that in giving people uh, confidence um, and I think some of the things that we've done you know ourselves in terms of releasing the capital buffers for example so that banks can absorb those losses the work we're doing on payment breaks and other central banks around the world as well who are you know taking similar steps are important in giving people confidence uh, but you know we can see this through um, and emerge uh, the other side. And from a European perspective do you think there's you know you mentioned you talked earlier on about the, the, the complementary relationship between what's happening on fiscal and monetary policy here. Do you think within it, within a European context, do you think there's a harmony between the role that the approach the ECB is taking and what the Commission is looking for and what the, the various different European institutions are? I mean, is it, is it more joined up than it was the last time around? And is it, I mean, are there any signs in your view for where that could fracture? So I think um, earlier on in the pandemic, as you know, everybody was trying to get to grips with what was going on, and um, it was more challenging than it is now. 
Um, I think at the beginning, um, when the ECB first introduced uh, the pandemic programme, you know, there were strong calls for a, a strong fiscal response. There was obviously a big debate about, you know, how that was going to happen and um, what the terms and conditions were going to be. Various policy instruments were being looked at um, and there was, I suppose, a period of uncertainty while all of that was going on. Uh, I think there's a lot more coherence now in what's being discussed in terms of the kind of recovery fund and how that's going to be taken forward. I appreciate, obviously, that there's still work to be done kind of agreeing um, all of that and exactly how it's going to be uh, executed. But I think you can see that uh, kind of coherence or coming together uh, in terms of um, how things might proceed. Of course, that has to be followed through. Uh, and then I think you get to this kind of ideal of, of fiscal policy and monetary policy really kind of mutually reinforcing and, and complementing each other. And final question for me, I'm, I'm sure anybody else wants to come in because we're talking about running up to the clock. Um, and I suppose it's, it's, it's again thinking back to the last, the last crisis. I mean, did you have a very strong view that the extent to which there is data available and research being done now is at a very different speed and pace? I mean, do you feel there's a sense in which as you go month to month, I know the, the bank itself has got its own indicators collected. Do you think that, that you know, the, from the last crisis, we have the benefit of having structures which give us more immediate information on the, on the economy so we're not waiting for the full uh, CSO data before we can actually take action? So I definitely think there have been some improvements um, and in the bank ourselves, you know, we've done a lot over the last number of years to enhance the data that we collect. Uh, we have, for example, now the central credit register in terms of what's going on the credit market, which we didn't have um, going into the previous crisis and proved to be, I think, uh, a really significant challenge because we didn't have that kind of knowledge and analysis. Having said that, I would say, you know, we have done some work on real time economic indicators over the last few weeks. And it was challenging, you know, there were things that we didn't necessarily collect uh, prior to this, I suppose, because what has happened is so unusual and so different uh, to anything uh, that we, we would have expected. So, you know, we're collecting data at the moment on kind of flights, on traffic, uh, like many others, we're looking at kind of, you know, data being produced by Google and the like on people's movements and so on. And um, so we are, I suppose, looking at quite different indicators to try and give us that sense. We have, though, I think, uh, made progress on things like using um, payments, uh, debit card payments, use of cash, the business cycle indicator that I talked about um, in my remarks. So I think in general, uh, we are definitely in a better place on kind of data and our ability to do quick analysis. But of course, that always depends on the circumstances. So, you know, we didn't have everything at our fingertips. Uh, that we would have liked in the context of what's just happened and I'm sure in the future other things will happen as well that turn out to be unexpected and, and we don't have exactly uh, the data that we would like uh, but for me data is central to po proper policy making it's a really important part of what we do at the bank it's a really important part I think also of what we produce publicly uh, so not just for us but for commentators people who are on the call economists academics and so on to also look at that data to be able to do uh, their analysis as well um, which we obviously also uh, look at in terms of thinking and informing our own uh, policy thinking as well. There's a question in from Dara Moriarty from the IIEA, and that's the financial, about your financial stability report, which was published yesterday. It notes the influx of overseas money into the commercial property market in Ireland in recent years and the high level, levels of debt against these assets. Uh, so the question is, do you have a view on the possible impact of increased remote working arrangements on commercial real estate values. In other words, is this you know, change, the, 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 new, the new normal, uh, is it going to actually have an impact back into the, uh, the demand for and the scale of requirement of commercial real estate? This is the first thing is just on that point that's in the financial stability report. I mean, the commercial real estate market in Ireland has changed quite significantly from the last crisis. So while the domestic Irish banks do have some exposure uh, to commercial real estate, it's nothing like the scale uh, they would have had going into the financial crisis. And there are significant more international investors uh, invested in Irish commercial real estate. Of course, that makes us vulnerable to kind of, um, you know, international issues then in terms of flight of investors who want to go and invest elsewhere. So I suppose it poses a slightly different type of risk. I mean, on commercial real estate in general, again, subject to significant uncertainty, it is an area that we're looking at. Personally, I, you know, I hear very mixed uh, messages about that. Of course, maybe people prefer working from home some of the time, uh, but also the huge benefits of people actually being able to socially interact, to being able to meet together. You know, the difference between being in the IIEA or being on this call. Um, so anything I've seen is about kind of the prospect for quite mixed um, effects in terms of offices and so on. 
I mean, our own experience at the bank also is in terms of social distancing and so on, to have people back at the office. For the people we will have back at the office, we actually need more space, not less. So it's like having these kind of competing forces um, um, against each other. So I do think there will be a kind of long term societal change. Uh, we've learned that we can do something maybe on a size and scale that we didn't expect we could. I think it will change about how people think about working from home and uh, maybe also how people think about where they want to live and commute and so on. Um, but whether actually the fundamentals of needing to get together and having interaction in some home base, uh, like an office, um, I think that ultimately will be required as well. Uh, but those kind of competing effects and how they ultimately turn out in uh, respect of the free market overall, I think remains quite uncertain. Listen, we're coming up um, to the to the to the wire. Is there anything that you would like to make by way of concluding remarks in terms of the way, in terms of where you see things? Uh, no, I, I think I've covered a lot uh, there in my remarks. Maybe just to remind people, um, if they are interested, uh, they're obviously available on the website along with the charts and a whole range of other material um, that we've been producing over the last couple of weeks, including as we've just been discussing some uh, real time um, economic indicators and so on. I think for us. Um, we've done a lot of work over the last number of years to try and build uh, the financial resilience of the system. Um, I think it has proved its value um, over recent weeks. The fact that we've had capital buffers, the fact that the mortgage rules were in place and so on, you know, have really uh, assisted how the economy is going to be able to bear this shock. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, there is profound uncertainty. I'd like to be able to you know, answer, I suppose, more clearly on some of the questions, but we are faced uh, with this very um, uncertain environment. Um, but certainly at the bank, we're very focused on making sure that our policy actions are effective and that we also try to help people understand, I suppose, what's going on and that they can also assess what's going on in the economy and contribute uh, to the debate at events like this um, at the IIEA and also more widely. So uh, just to thank the IIEA again and yourself, Francis, um, it's lovely to have an opportunity to talk to people if in a different way. Mm -hmm.